say there was another change and she died. Uh, she was resting quietly, perfectly home, perfectly at home, and I followed her crying. Yeah, you know what? It seemed I hadn't comprehended fate, so I stopped. This is a thing where the, any of you who read Chinese, I would love it if you – no, you can't read this because it's ancient classical Chinese, which is insanely difficult even for Mandarin readers. But, but this is where things like the translation – does the Chinese even need the pronoun she? Those of you who study Mandarin enough, you know that you don't need the subject in the sentence half as often. It's not a sentence fragment if, if changed. Do you want this? A very grammatically correct sentence would, would, to answer that question was, would be, yao, yeah, I want it. Yao, but yao, yao, not I want, just want, right? Because the verb's the important thing. In the same way, suddenly change instead of she changed. Do you see how the, the translation might be like making us go, oh, the word she? That's English. That's English grammar. Um, what about the, uh, I think we talked about this last time. What did Master Chi say or whoever it was when he was changing into a freak and, and uh, he was like, what's, or no, maybe it was, Laos's funeral, Zhong's funeral. I don't know. What's that thing where it's like a bug's, a bug's eye, a, a bug's arm? Okay, to me, that's the – and notice nobody brought that up, maybe because it came up last time. But to me, that's the strongest evidence for any sort of reincarnation being claimed. No, no, no. That's not what you brought up. The bug's arm and so forth, that's not the rooster and the ass wheel thing? No. Okay, so you talked about it when? Okay. Okay. So, uh, okay, so now we've got something that's to me the strongest evidence, and I think it's probably when I was like dealing with five technological things. Who knows? He does say, read the line for us, please, loudly. Okay. Is this an argument for reincarnation? Do I have anybody who can argue against those who say, yes, this is an argument for reincarnation besides me? And I'm going to argue that your second possibility is more strongly supported by the text if you read and think about it carefully and closely. So I ask if anybody else can follow my lead and go, yeah, this is not a real persuasive thing. But yes, you're going to like come back as a different person or animal or something. You do survive. You reincarnate. Death is not the end of you. You go on. You don't need the body. You go on. You'll have another body. Tegan. I'm sorry. Are you responding to the question I just asked or are you just changing the subject? I want somebody to respond to the question I asked. Thank you, Isabel. be reinterpreted as a, as a bug's arm or a rat's liver. I'm sorry, but what were you in your past life? A rat's liver? That doesn't, that's, just, that's not reincarnated, especially since he like, I don't know. Finally. It makes a lot more sense for, for all the nutrients in my decomposed flesh to be like uh, eaten and turned into like, you know, to support the growth of whatever creature eats the flower or the fruit that grew from the nutrients of my corpse when I become fertilizer and fertilize next spring stuff. And then an animal eats that and all sorts of stuff, right? I don't see any evidence at all for, to end this, for the idea that we go anywhere after we die. Life does, and that's chi. And by the way, if you want to know what chi is, I don't have it anymore. Somehow it's not on my wall anymore. Oh, yeah, here we go. These landscape paintings of China, 
started around the Tang highlight in the Song Dynasty, the mist that you constantly see in Chinese between the mountains, the mist rising, qi comes from that. The word for weather, tian qi, tian qi hen hao, right? The word for weather, qi, that's the same word. The, the mist that comes out of the earth every day. The earth has life in it, and that mist is our evidence. It's like, like my spirit moving my body around. Something moves out of the earth, qi, spirit. But it's formless. And the Chinese took that as sort of the life force. Right? Because they see it, the earth exhale it every morning. And they see it rise up in the, you know, in the valleys between the mountains. And, um, but it's certainly not, oh, there's Tegan's chi rising up out of the earth over there. There's the Tegan cloud of chi. No, it's just when we die, chi remains. And hello, look, there's chi everywhere. Uh, did I see a hand or anything else? Yeah. Yes, but I don't think Confucius believed in ancestors either. Notice what we have going here. We have an elite philosophical. These people are writing, therefore they're elites. This is so, this is so actually it's hugely important. It may not seem to you now, so I'm pointing it out to you because it is if you think about it. If you're writing, you are elite by definition. And if you're reading philosophical texts, in China, by definition, you're elite because it takes forever to learn those characters and be able to write them and read them. Only people with luxury and leisure can do it. So notice that we have, I've made the argument, Confucius doesn't believe in spirits. He never talked about them. He didn't talk about miracles. He said, perform the rituals as if the ancestors were near. On and on and on. Confucius is not about pleasing the spirits. That's not why he's doing this stuff. He's not religious. He's doing the rituals because the rituals keep us together as family and as community if we do it with heart and propriety, good form. We're just the best we can be together. We're basically dancing together and pretending that spirits are there. Confucius doesn't care if the spirits are there or not. The Taoists are not making any argument at all about ancestors. Notice ancestors don't exist at all in any Taoist text that I have read. I can't recall the appearance of ancestors once. Can you? Ancestor spirits? That absence is fascinating. Taoism doesn't talk about the ancestor spirits at all. So that's my second piece of evidence that I can remember. So that's my second piece of evidence that these elites are even less religious than the Western Joe who did seem to believe in the ancestors, right? In their ritual to the Joe ancestors, right? They, the, the spirits. So what we see is an increasing secularism or atheism Atheism is a stupid word. It means I don't believe in God. There's never been a God here anyway since Sean B. So, a see, English can't handle China because atheism is the wrong word. They're, they were never theists to start with. That's just a very strange Western thing. But they don't believe in the spirit world. Confucius, we, I, I know what I know and I know what I don't know. If he meant that, and he's a smart guy, he knows he knows. He knows he doesn't know about spirits, ancestor spirits. So he's not persuaded about them. The Taoists don't even mention them. But so who is that left to like really believe in them? The uneducated unelite, the illiterate unelite, the lower classes. They're going to like have all sorts of spirit stuff in their heads because they're not like engaging in philosophical conversation. They're farming. They're working. And, and so this is called folk religion. Folk religion as in the people the common people, folk. Um, and in the same way, you know, who... Yeah, so, so, so there are two levels throughout Chinese history. The elites, the Confucians, they were never religious. But the Chinese commoners, who they, who they were over, they were. They believed in these spirits. They believed in all sorts of afterlifes, heavens, hells, all sorts of stuff. You'll, we'll come to that later. The elites never did. But they let them perform the rituals as if the ancestors were present because the rituals are important, because they keep us together, unified, and in good etiquette form, proper people, good people. And they give us a good time, because the rituals are festivals. Quite often, they're festivals, right? The Dragon Boat Festival, it's a ritual. 
It's not Easter Sunday. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and, and throw this in very quickly. When I was tw here's a story about why if I do die next, let me see, uh, I'm 51 now, my birthday, I'll be 52 in May, and then I'll be 53 in May of next year. So this is 2014, 2015. If I die by May 4th, 2015, I'll die happily. I have the feeling I will, okay? I have the feeling that I will be dead while you're still here in high school, that I'm gonna die at 52. Why? Because when I was at University of Oregon, just doing my University of Oregon student thing one day, probably thinking about Greek philosophy or something, a strange premonition hit me, just like a sledgehammer, and it just stopped me. I'm going to die at 52. I was 26 years old, and it just hit me so hard, and I'm not a superstitious guy at all. But I'm also like not oblivious to being hit in the head by a sledgehammer, premonition, that is like, I can't forget, that that was an unforgettable experience, that I was filled with such a premonition that I would die at 52. I was 26 then, I'm 51 now. I haven't forgotten that premonition since my 26th year in Oregon. And I, right, and so here I am now, and so it's been a joke. <laughs> it's been a joke every decade, but now, it's like, okay, 48, funny when you tell the kids, 49, funny when you tell the kids, 50, oh, oh that's kind of weird, 51, yeah, here I am, I'm 51, and I'm telling you, and I've always told them when I teach this, Taoism has a way of making death not scary, I think we hit that last time, of making death something that is absolutely okay, of making life something that is absolutely, absolutely inexpressibly special because we were lucky enough to have it and something to be treasured every single moment because from the Taoist point of view there is nothing you do disappear this is it the beginning when we talked China's radical natural thing and the Joe ancestor hymn and and the spirits wanting to come back into that impersonator's body. I said it, and I'll repeat it, because I think it's one of the most beautiful things that I see when I, when I look at China. Earth is heaven. And we're temporary angels. We're mortal angels. Earth is heaven. And because we know we're mortal, and we know that this is heaven, right here and right now, this earth. Please stop. Um then we value our time with the days and the people and the ideas and the learning and the play and the animals and everything because we know that we're leaving it at some point. And so it's a wonderful thing to, uh, to appreciate your, your, your life while you have it. Um, so the cool thing is you are now – of the age where you will be in high school still, if, if that premonition was right. I hope it's not. Of course, I'd love to live to maybe no more than 88. That 89 thing started going downhill. That's why I learned with Dad. Um, there's a certain point at which I want to die, but not 52. So if I do, though, the, the, you understand why it's like, don't freaking cry. Throw a Zhuangzi at his wife's funeral party, right? I had a good time. It's been wonderful. I could die tomorrow happy. Um, but I hope, I almost hope that I do, because then you can go like, wow, he was right. Jesus, Mr. Bell died. And I hope, you know, it's totally natural and quick and painless, but if it happens, then how cool would that be for you, right? Because you'll be like, God, and I promise I won't, like, cheat. I won't cheat and make it happen, right? But it would be totally cool if it did. I mean, well, that would be a cool thing among several less cool things, like, oh, but I didn't get to, like, keep living on Earth that's heaven temporarily uh that's the chinese point of view and from that point of view there's a lot of beauty there okay what do you think about the lost horse it's told horribly do you see how do you see how this will help you if you remember Tao? do you see how helpful Taoism is as just like a a, a refreshing breath of sanity 
it's like it's like wow, the the, the Taoists are so sane. It's just amazing how sane they are. It's just like the most impressive thing about them is that they're sane, right? Radically sane. That's my new radical, right? They're radically sane and sanitary, very clean. Uh, because the next time somebody breaks your heart, betrays you, you don't get what you want, it feels like just misfortune has just like sledgehammered you, like smashed you like a heel smashing a cockroach in the kitchen. You're the cockroach. The next time you're crushed by something that just like seems to end your world, what does this tell you? Maybe it was the best thing that ever happened to you. It doesn't tell you that. Everything happens for a reason, really? Whose reason? Whose reason? Are you putting some God up there in Tien, the empty, the empty heavens? That... So whose reasons? What reasons? Everything happens for a reason? That's such a Western view. I'm just trying to get you out of your, out of your bubble to see the radically different view here. It has not to do with there being any reason at all. It has something to do with something very different. I feel like it's kind of like the, uh, the symbol up there. Good follows bad, bad follows good. Good follows bad, bad follows good. Although I'm not sure that's good and bad. It says that thing is a very positive word and disaster is a very negative word. So it says what makes you so sure that you can stop it? Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, good, good, good. I'll, I'll meet you there. To me, it's the long view. It's the long view, right? Don't be so quick, exactly. Time. You are forgetting time. You are reacting to the present pain and not realizing how, as you say, everything, you know, it takes time for everything to turn. Famous, famous joke in Chinese history by the modern Chinese Prime Minister of Mao Zedong, Zhou Enlai. He was asked after the communists actually talked to the Americans towards the close of the Cold War. Zhou Enlai was asked what he thought about the success. Uh, of liberal democracy, the French Revolution forward, right? When democracy started. What do you think? Has democracy been a success? Joe and I? And Joe and I answered in 1974-ish. No, 72 maybe. He died in 74. Or 76. Uh, Joe and I answered, it's too soon to tell. The French Revolution was in 1789. He's asked about something that happened almost 200 years ago. And he goes, it's too, more than 200. And he's like, oh, it's too soon to tell. The Chinese think in much, much more longer term. We already hit that, didn't we, with uh, Wall Street money never sleeps. And so you just failed me again by like, like letting me say it without instead of saying Mr. Bovary said that. Being bullied for three years in high school to the point where I was almost suicidal, I definitely did not go to elite college because despite the fact that my ACT score was the third highest in the high school, my GPA was a D because I was skipping school, smoking pot, and, and trying not to kill myself because I was surrounded by dumb jocks who bullied me mercilessly when I never did anything to them other than make their girlfriends go, oh, he's cute. Um, <laughs> you know, so great. So just let's, let's all band together the football team, the basketball team, the baseball team, the dumb jock team, the herd of dumb jocks, and call him faggot every time we see him for three years, right? Almost made me kill myself in high school. Thank God for pot. That saved me. <laughs> right? I was in, I self-medicated, right? I am suicidal here, so how can I deaden this pain uh, caused by a sick society? And uh, and I did it with pot, so thank God for that. But <laughs> thanks God for pot. Um, <laughs> you were so funny. I quoted you on Facebook today from your journal, your your forum. Um, and it's the best thing that ever happened to me. That three years of near suicidal misery was the best thing that ever happened to me because I would have become a dumb jock because I was an athlete until I became a new student and the jocks, you know, didn't want their girlfriends to date me and so they, they, that was their way of dealing with me, right? Um, and so I, so I didn't become one of them and I became instead a guy who, thanks to them pushing me out of this normal like herd mentality, sheeple jock mentality, I became a guy who was on the outside and I started like, because of the pain, I started looking for stuff. And that's what led to all of that. That's my library, right, right there. So, uh, so my life became really interesting because I didn't become just a dumb jock who just like watches sports for the rest of his life and has a family, right? Thank God I was bullied mercilessly. That was good luck, not bad luck. That's the kind of thing that this thing is talking about.
I didn't know in the midst of it, but I've looked back upon it and reflected upon it. And had it not been for that, I'd be such a boring person right now. I'd be a, carb a carbon copy of every guy who talked about what happened in sports this week and what happened on TV this week and what happened on YouTube this week and blah, blah, blah. But, uh, so Taoism is just so radically sane. Negative golden rule and water. Let's see. In order to get through this quickly, we're now on topic three. What do you think of wish, wish and all full, Confucius negative golden rule? Speak quickly, huh? Really? Okay, wish, wish, and awful makes absolute sense to me. Really? Let's review the story very quickly. In the north, there was a kingdom of who cares? I'm just going to make it right. So in the north, wish, wish, wishes kingdom. Am I right? In the south, wishes kingdom. And in the center, awful's kingdom. And they were all friends. And whenever wish needed to, to, to visit wish, or wish needed to visit wish, they had to pass through awful's middle kingdom. And Awful was a really nice king, and he was like, oh, you're traveling here, I'll be a good host here, you can stay at my place, all this sort of stuff. And, they were, uh, and he did it to both of them whenever they like visited each other. He was just such a nice guy, Wush. I'm sorry, Awful. And so Wish and Wush were like, Awful is so nice. He's so nice. Let's do the nicest thing we can think for him. Let's just try to, let's, let's come up with the best good idea we can to make him happy, to show our thanks. Hmm. You know, it's funny. We have seven holes in our heads, but he doesn't. So sad. He doesn't have seven holes in his head. Let's give him a present because it's Chwanza. Let's give Jesus on acid. Let's give him a present. And so every day, because they know that having two eyes and two, uh, uh, you know, having eyes and a nose and a mouth, being able to see and smell and taste and, and hear, they know that's excellent. And the poor guy, they know that he'll be much better if he has the good stuff, enjoys the same things that we enjoy. So they drilled them into his head, and on the seventh day he died. What's not to get about that? <laughs> so funny. Here's Chuang's at his best. What's the moral of this story? Um, what you think is may not be like right to other people. It may be okay for you, but if you try to change it, if you impose your own good on other people, maybe it's not good for them. If you think your good is the only good, I repeat, and this one's the deepest one, one of the deepest ones of this entire, entire semester. If you think your good is the only good, you can kill people by trying to do them favors. You can hurt people by imposing your own good. Is that not what Wish and Wish are trying to do? Impose their own idea of what's good on somebody else. Out of the best intentions, they're good people with a bad understanding of the world because they're trying to they don't understand that there are other goods, that what's good for them is not necessarily what's good for whoosh. I'm sorry, for all four. And they killed a guy, trying to do good to him. Confucius says don't do to others what you would not want others to do to you. Would you want them to bring a drill into your head seven times? No. Okay, that's, I've never tried to approach this this idea this way, so let me think of a better way to do that. Jesus says, do to others what you, what you, how you, do to others what you want other people to do to you. That's the positive golden rule. How do you treat others? The way you want to be treated. Confucius says, negative golden rule. Don't do to others what you would not want people to do to you. I submit to you that the Chinese Okay, so now, does Zhuangzi come closer to, who, who would Zhuangzi agree with, Confucius, the negative golden rule?
for Jesus, do to others what you wish others would do to you. And so are they being more Confucian or more Christian with their golden rule? Wish and wish. Are they being more Confucian or more Christian with their good act? Have you ever met a Confucian missionary coming up and saying, have I done this with you before? Have you ever met a Confucian missionary come up to you anywhere and like go, hi, listen, um, I just wondered if you knew the good news about ritual. And, and because if you do ritual, then, then it will change your life. And so I, and if you don't, well, then your life will just be horrible. And I really want, because, because I know that this is like the only way to have a good life. You, I re, it's important for me to like, right? And, and I knew a guy that that happened to. And he was from a very, very Christian family. And when he like told his parents, mom, dad, I met this, this Confucian um, ritual missionary and, and he persuaded me to like drop out of Christianity and become a Confucian. The parents went ballistic, ape shite, and, and kicked him out of the house, out of anger, when this Confucian was just trying to do a nice thing to that Christian, right? But the, but the Confucian didn't realize, the Confucian missionary didn't realize that what was good to the Confucian missionary ended up hurting the Christian who left his family. Suddenly his family rejected him, disowned him, all sorts of stuff. I'm kidding. I made that whole story up. But have you ever seen or been, I have, a Christian who walked up to other people and said, listen, can I talk to you about, if, if you were to die tomorrow, do you know what would happen to you? Right? In other words, do Christians walk around like saying, I have to save these people because it's good. I know it's good, and I have to save them. I know it's good, and I have to save those who don't know it's good. I have to save them. They don't know, but I know it's good, right? The negative golden rule. That's why there are no, like, Chinese missionaries. That's why we don't know about Confucianism or Taoism, because the Chinese don't go around trying to spread it on other people. You like what you see? Like the, the, the Mao tribe when Yao Shun and Yu, was it Yu who didn't fight them, or who did fight the Mao, the Mao and the Xu Jing for the longest time, and then they said, stop fighting them, and they'll submit when they just see how superior you are, right? Don't try to force blah, blah, blah. Again, in the Ming Dynasty, Christians and Confucians are going to encounter. And guess who comes to who, right? Guess who, see, who, who seeks out who? It's the, the missionaries who come to China. It's not the Chinese who go to the West. And so I hope it's not uncomfortable for you because it's the climax of East-West history. Um, I'll go ahead and give you the term and the Chinese today still use it. Uh, coming back from Taipei, I had a conversation in the smoking area of the Taipei airport with a Taiwanese guy um, who spoke English. And he told me, he was like, you know about the concept Wu Wei, right? And I was like, it's like, dude, I teach Chinese philosophy and history. But anyway. It's called non-action. Non-action, that's the dumbest thing in the world, the Taoist, the Taoist uh, principle of Wu Wei, of non-action and bad English translations, because clearly, oh yes, we're wise. What's our wisdom? Do nothing. Okay, after how long, of, how long would you survive if you literally took do nothing as your, your Tao, your way of life? How long would you survive? Two? Two? I think longer than two. Oh, really? Okay, all right. I'm persuaded. Two days, right? Don't do anything. Die of dehydration in two days. Stupid. So, so but this is, this is the, uh, the adventure of reading Chinese thought in English. They translate it so poorly so often. And so the best we've come up with now, many, many really cool people struggle with how to translate it. My favorite is non-coercive. or non-interfering. 
And somebody in their journal, actually, or in their forum, actually wrote about this non-interference of the Chinese, how they just don't get into other people's stuff. Who was it? Was it one of you in the most interesting thing forums? So, so that's what it's not. It's not non-coercive action or non-interfering action. Wish and whoosh interfered, coerced, forced. Coerced means force, right? So they forced their idea of the good on whoosh. I'm sorry, on awful. And this is why awful would have been better off not knowing these good people. <laughs> because they didn't understand that there's more than one good in the world. And their good is not the only one. And in fact, their good can even be bad. Anything else on water? No action, not meddlesome. Yeah, that's actually Ivanhoe. Oh, sorry, that's a different class. The guy, the the professor in Hong Kong, he, uh, uh, he edited this and taught the guy who translated this. And and it's a very playful translation, and that's why I chose it, because I like his English playful, because awful versus awful and all sorts of things, right? Um, and wish, the sound of a swing and a miss, and whoosh, the sound of a swing and a miss in baseball, right? Just the sound of like, I don't know, also, but it's suggestive, and it has nothing to do with the Chinese names in the, the, the original Zhuangzi. But notice, uh, in Chapter 63, somebody wrote about this. Do you see what, what's, what's nice about the non-action here, the, non, the, the non-coercive action or the non-interfering action? They're not saying don't act. When, when, we don't want to be miserable here. You don't act, you're going to die in two days. So how do, you, how do you keep big problems from happening? By being conscious enough to see them to see them before this thing turns enough, before time passes enough for a small problem to become a big problem. So to difficult things in the world must must have their beginnings in the easy. Um, if you think things are going to be easy, oh man, life is going to get difficult for you. You've got to have like the sort of uh, the the again the foresight to think in the long term. Um, so somewhere in here it talks about yeah yeah don't let don't let difficult things wait because they just become worse and worse. Don't like come beg to your teacher at the end of a semester of doing no homework when instead all you have to do is just like do a little homework early. Uh, who has who has the water one? Does anybody have any questions about the water? Because I want to get on to Royal Nag. Royal Nag. Why is water such a... And remember in the Confucius movie, water was... Zhuangzi, or, or Lao Tzu was talking about water. So why is water... Is water yin or yang? Can you think of water sometime being yang? So water is a perfect example of, of the fact that things are not necessarily always yin or always yang, right? Um, water, when it's flowing in a waterfall, that's yang, right? Water, when it's a tidal wave, that's yang. But in any case, uh, what did you get out of here? Look at, look at your annotations here and just tell me because I want to get to Royal Nag. Royal Nag. Look at annotations on the idea of water. And, and what did you finally pull out of this thing? Why did the Taoists put so much emphasis on water?
Chapter 8, can somebody seriously? What are the values that we see here in Chapter 8 of the data chain? Who said it? Don't compete. How radically sane. What are we but just the most madhouse of competition at this school? Don't you feel that? Aren't you constantly, constantly, constantly competing? Isn't the freaking college acceptance letter season just the most bizarre and truly mentally unhealthy thing you've ever seen in your life? Everybody is totally stressing over what college they did or did not get into and also feeling like suicidal over the fact that A did, but I didn't get into B, C, or D. Would Confucius disagree with this view of competition? Don't compete. Don't compete. Would Confucius disagree with it? Half? Half? That's a nice nuanced answer. Let me hear your, your yes and no. Against others. Yeah. Any other thoughts on this? In Con Do you remember Confucius talking about archery? Oh, I don't know if they had that in HOC, in the Analects reading. Confucius says an archer, who does an archer compete with in an archery competition? Archer one stands up, draws a string. You saw Confucius have an archery competition against somebody in the movie, right? And then the second archer draws a string. Who is the archer really competing against? Say more. You say himself. He's, he's trying to do better than he did the last shot. He's trying to get the best possible outcome. You're not competing against the other archer. You're competing against the very best you have been able to do, the most excellent you can be, right? So that's, that's inner cultivation. I'm trying to be the best person I can be, and that's why he considers archery to be the most civilized of all sports, because it is just one person's ability after which another person's ability. There, no, there, there is no force going on between these two people. It is simply which of us is most excellent at the alignment of mind, body, and surroundings, uh, and calmness, and so forth. So I don't hate you for winning the archery contest because the problem was with me. Yeah. Does that mean he likes golf? Probably. Except that golf tends to be something that people say, oh, I'm so rich, I belong to a golf club, and you probably hate that part. But, um, And it's also the, the sort of sport of profit seekers. You know, What do businessmen do? It's like, oh, I, I'm playing golf at a really expensive place. I have succeeded. Like, really? Is that all there is? But anyway. Um, but yes, golf and archery, very similar. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about is there anything else you want to talk about on that one? That one's not particularly. Yeah. With what? Like, what did you think he did with the other hundred schools of thought? He, like, sponsored by Lauren. It's like. Yeah, again, I mean, yeah. Um, but I don't think they're doing it to win. I think they're doing it because they, they want the warring states period to stop. They're not doing it so they can, like, say, I got into Harvard and you didn't, Confucians. I, they're not trying to beat the Confucians. They're trying to argue for the good. They're trying to make the, the, the lords agree that their target is the target that can end the warring states period. So I don't see this competition against the other schools. I think I see it as a lot of schools all like saying, this is the best solution, not we're better than them. It's not, it's not about them winning. It's about their vision winning. And that's complete. Do you hear where I'm going with that? 
it's kind of weird to think of them as like trying to beat each other. They're trying to succeed at getting their vision to be taken seriously because we're in the middle of a 200 year World War II here. And if you listen to those guys, it's going to be a 300 year World War II. And that's, nobody wants that, right? So I don't, I don't hear that as petty competitiveness. I hear that as compassion, right? Conflicting compassion. Where does water like to be? The lowest point. So if you're a Taoist, you're going to like prefer the lowest point. You're going to be the person who never even tried to go to Harvard. Because water, here's another Taoist uh, principle, the path of least resistance. It's the last day Friday. It's the last class Friday. I feel the same. I see your faces, a lot of you anyway. And I feel the same way, and I'm sorry that you had this on the last day Friday. There's beautiful stuff here. Um, the path of least resistance. Water, by its very nature, doesn't try to go through hard surfaces. If water hits a brick wall, like I just can't get math, I just can't do it. I can't do math. I have tried my hardest, and I'm just not good at it. I have, tr right? For example, me and anything having to do with calm hands, because I just can't, because my hands shake, right? If I were determined to get an A plus in guitar or whatever, I would like continue, like totally drive myself crazy because I need an A plus because college is so important, blah blah blah. Um, and I would bang my head against this brick wall until the, my head broke because the brick wall is not going to. Water would flow around it. The path of least resistance. Water doesn't stress. Water doesn't try to use force against obstacles. Water goes around them. All of these lords in the warring states period, all competing against each other, attacking each other, invading each other, besieging each other, assassinating each other, betraying each other, and all of these nobles and elites competing against each other for the attention of these lords, and this rat race of competition among the elites to climb the top, the ladder to the top of what's basically an elite shithill, right? All right, I'm, I'm on top of the elite shithill. The Dallas are like, <laughs> water smarter. It doesn't try to, it doesn't stress itself out trying to climb to the top of what is a corrupt elitehood where once you get there, congratulations, you're hanging out with a bunch of, you know, absolute corrupt elites. Water defies the conventional normal wisdom and the, the herd instinct, and water settles where nobody else wants to. And it doesn't get assassinated, betrayed, <laughs> invaded. Um, or corrupted, yeah. Yes, Taoism is very, very, very different from Confucianism. Although Confucius does say, as, as many of you noted, right, you remember this, if in, in bad times, it's a shame to succeed. In a bad state, it's a shame. It's shameful to succeed. In a good state, it's shameful to not succeed. In a good culture, it's shameful to not to. But in a bad one, it's shameful too. So there's sort of an overlap here with, you know, if you settle like water in the low places, where everybody in the rat race is like, oh, no, don't like just be like middle class. That would be horrible. You've got to like drink out of gold champagne cups or something or else life is unthinkable. Um, Oh, we won't talk about Royal Nag and the, and the muteless, the muteless, legless sage. Do you have any ideas about him? 
This is where John, John's it gets funny, but it's Friday after school. I mean, it's almost Friday after school. So, so let's start it. Here's John's of messing with Confucius just in an epic manner. Do you remember the story? Royal Nag. In Lou, there was a legless amputee. Picture it. No legs, named Royal Nag, who had as many followers as Confucius. I picture him on those little, like, carts with four wheels that the, the legless people in certain third world countries drag themselves around on. And Chang Ji asked Confucius, Royal Nag's an amputee, but he has as many disciples as you do. And he doesn't stand and teach, ha, 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 he has no legs, or sit and discuss. Yet they go to him empty and come home full. He is mute, he doesn't talk, and he's legless, he doesn't move. And everybody comes to him and, and ha follow him as much as Confucius. What's going on there? Can there be teaching without words? And Chaka, this sort of gets back to Taoism and Confucian. Can there be teaching with well, oh, words or a developed mind in a deformed body? Notice the deformed body. Ritual propriety, everything is supposed to be like inspiringly perfect and just so. Notice how Zhuangzi likes to play with deformity and images of deformity. Notice that nobody said the most beautiful line of either Master Chariot or uh, Zhuangzi's funeral, whichever one it was. Stop. Get back. Don't be afraid of the change. Didn't any of you like just find that a most striking line? I can't hear you. Okay, because it's beautiful. Again, that's I mean that's that is the beauty of the of the Taoist view of death. And notice, in China, amongst the non elites, clearly people did freak out over death, just like we're saying that other cultures do. Winner for most eliminations is Ellie Conti with 11 elimination eliminations. She will receive $100 for her service book. The winner for best selfie is Stephanie Yee, who also wins $100.